The Apostle John, I believe, is uh, arguably the most prolific New Testament writer on the subject of love. His gospel, the, um, his uh, contribution to uh, the quartet of gospel witnesses concerning the life, uh, earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ He uses a form of the word love in that gospel 57 times in 39 verses. In uh, 1 John, his first uh, epistle, uh, he uses a form of the word love 51 times in 29 verses. And uh, each of those two, the gospel of John and the first epistle of John... Each of those two contain more verses on love than any other New Testament book. The Apostle Paul spoke of love in 10 more verses than John does. John in 87, excuse me, 77 total verses and Paul in 87 total verses. But to do that, he wrote almost three times the number of biblical books in order to do it. Paul, 14 books, where John wrote or penned five. John and Paul combined as two of the seven New Testament authors, they penned over 80% of the verses on the subject of love in the New Testament as a whole. Paul does that, makes his mark by virtue of the volume of material that he wrote. Where John accomplishes his part of that by virtue of the focus of his writing. And so it is no coincidence that John is referred to or known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so as we uh, look for, uh, in these waning days of the month of May and focusing on the love of God, we dare not ignore the writings of John. And so in this passage of Scripture, we have in verses 5 and 6, some helpful things for us on the subject. And I want to speak this, this evening on the supremacy of love. The supremacy of love. Now, in so doing, it's going to be hard to stay away really from 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about now by faith, hope, and charity Charity being another word for love. And it says, but the greatest of these is charity. We might get to that a little bit next Sunday morning and, uh, uh, excuse me, Wednesday night and Sunday morning. And Wednesday night we might get into 1 Corinthians 13 a little bit. We haven't had time to do it so far this month, really. But I want to just point out some things concerning how love is supremely important in the Christian life. I want to say, first of all, I want to point out love's antiquity. Love's antiquity. Notice in verse number 5, the Bible declares, he says, I, not as I wrote uh, a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning. It has always been God's plan that we have love for one another. It, is, it was his desire uh, from the moment that he set his affection on us that we would in turn set our affection on others. And so uh, the Bible talks about uh, that which was from the beginning. We are going to get into it in just a moment about the greatest commandments. But think about this. The commandments of God reveal to us the character of God. 
this last uh, January when we had our conference and the conference theme was uh, preaching on the law of God. And it was not what most people would assume it is. Preaching on the law of God, uh, it kind of gives the idea that we're going to be preaching on the thou shalt and thou shalt nots and, and, uh, and et cetera. And I was advised, uh, matter of fact, it was on my heart to do that, that theme for about three or four years. And, and I kept being waved off of it. People say, oh, you know, <clears throat> preaching on the law, that's a, that's a heavy topic. You know, people need to be encouraged and you're going to, you want to, you know, get them in and preach to them about the law of God. And, and I think it's because uh, we have this, uh, this uh, rebellious uh, uh, context to our sinful DNA that we just want to rebel against God's commandments. And I'm not, I'm not talking about as Christians, I'm saying the natural man, right? The natural man receiveth not the things uh, uh, of, of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. He can't know them. He, he does not want them. And, and even it carries over, I believe, into the Christian life, so much so that if you go into the average church and you say, I'm going to talk about the law of God, someone, at least in their heart and mind, is going to have the re initial reaction, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And we fall into that trap because uh, we are basically, we like the idea that we're not under law. We have a, a rebellious bent to us against God's commandments. But it is God's commandments that lead us to Christ, right? The law, the Bible says, was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Paul said, had it not been for the law, I would not have understood my sin. So sin, excuse me, God's law revealed to Paul his sin so that he understood he needed a Savior. The law then has never been our enemy. It has been our friend. Yet it only comes into play as against us when uh, if man rejects God's gracious invitation to accept Jesus Christ as uh, uh, their personal Savior. But I want to say also, while I'm here, just to remind us that the law really reveals the character of God. Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. When God said that we are to avoid that which is wicked, is because he is everything the opposite of wicked. When it says that we are to uh, pursue Holiness is because he is holy. So when the Bible says, lie not, it's because God cannot lie. It, the law reveals the nature and the character of God. And if you want to, to get farther into that, I encourage you to, to uh, go back in our, in our uh, archives and find the, the messages preached on that during our conference in January and it will help you, but we need to understand this, that because, because these things find their root, they find their meaning, they find their origin, uh, they find their genesis in the person of God, uh, that means love did not start on the cross of Calvary. Love did not start in the Garden of Eden. Love is ancient, meaning beyond uh, what man knows, because God did not become love. He's always been love. God is love. That makes it, because it is his character, because it is part of, his, his, uh, of who he is, that makes it the oldest thing, one of the oldest things around, right? Because there's nothing that goes back before God. Jesus himself, declaring his own deity, said, before Abraham was, I am. There's never a before God time. God has always been. 
He still is. He always will be. And so therefore, love uh, is ancient. Love is original. In love is, matter of fact, if you want to go back before uh, the creation of the world, before God spake and the, and, uh, and the earth uh, came into existence before the stars were created, and there was still, there was already God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And within the Trinity, the uh, Godhead, you had love. Because God the Father, it is declared, he, he declared his love for God the Son. So love's antiquity. I'd say secondly, I want you to notice the heart of love or love's heart in verse number six of our text. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. You see, we're sold a bill of goods today because we like to get our religion from the world of entertainment instead of the scriptures, the body of God's truth in the word of God. We like to get our, our uh, the way we uh, worship God, uh, we use as our resource those coming out of colleges with, instead of meaningful degrees in doctrine and theology, uh, they come out uh, with degrees in drama and, uh, and you know, uh, ways to market the church or market God to a, a lost world, we find that they come out uh, better equipped to make commercials about, about how Jesus gets you instead of, but they, but they couldn't find the book of Genesis, couldn't find anything in the word of God. And so, but the heart of, of love is, this is love that we walk after his Commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, help me. What does it say? Keep my commandments. You cannot show any deeper level of love for God than to simply obey what he has told you to do. How can you, how can anyone rebel against the commandments of God and say, oh, but I love Jesus? Well, I love Jesus. Now, I don't want to do anything he tells me to do, but I sure love him. Love is, listen, love is not uh, in, in uh, metered rhyme and chorus put to music. Love is in the living of obedience. Love is not uh, in, uh, in carefully phrased words that, that rhyme every other line. Uh, it is not uh, expressed. Uh, by, you know, jumping around on the platform with electric guitars and, and begging on cymbals. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, if you, have, uh, if, you have, uh, no, if you don't have charity, even though you are spiritually gifted, you are become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And boy, the more I think about it, if that doesn't tell you about where praise and worship teams come from, it is just sounding brass. It is just tinkling cymbals, meaning it lacks really the love that we ought to have for God. Why? Because to love God means to keep his commandments. Uh, don't lose your place here, but in Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse number 8. Romans 13 and verse number 8 down through verse number 10. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Well, I tell you what, I, somebody you think, somebody ought to write a book on that. Somebody already did. It's called the Word of God. You can't say it any better than God did. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second one is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How did Jesus sum up the Ten Commandments? In Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40, he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. James 2, 8, if, if ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Galatians 6 and verse number 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So in Romans 13, where he begins quoting parts of what we know as the Ten Commandments. These are things that show love for one another. The Ten Commandments, as I've often referred to, can be divided into two categories. The first four, those relating to our relationship with God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those had to do with our relationship with God. The last six of those were those that relate uh, the, those concerning our relationship with others. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Now, while God gave those commandments, he was aiming at the heart of man, not simply the hands or feet of man. When he said, when the Bible says, set no wicked thing before your eye, he really doesn't want wicked things in your heart, and he knows that the eye is a gate into your heart. Romans 7 and verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, being dead in wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, in Romans chapter 12, where we were just reading, the Bible says we are to owe no man anything except to love one another because he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Then he starts quoting the Ten Commandments. You say, what's that got to do with anything? Well, if you love someone, you don't commit adultery. Why? Because adultery is a sin against somebody besides yourself. It's a sin against others as well because you're being uh, unfaithful to your own spouse, causing someone else to be unfaithful to theirs. Thou shalt not kill. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, amen? If you kill somebody, you did not love them. Thou shalt not steal. To steal from somebody else is not showing them love. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That means uh, testify falsely against them or say things falsely against them. Thou shalt not covet to want what they have, to wish you could take what they have. And any other commandment is summarized in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So love then is the fulfilling of the law, right? If, you, if, you, if you're going to love God, you're going to keep his commandments. Uh, this, uh, this is love, verse number six, back in our text in 2 John, verse number six. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. God, 
as I said, was aiming at the heart. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke and he said in Matthew 5, you've heard that it was said, and he quotes some part of the law, and he says, but I say unto you, and he did not lessen the commandment, he strengthened the commandment. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that if a man looks after a woman to lust after him in his heart, he's committed adultery already in his heart. That's not a lower standard, that's a higher standard. Grace does not release us to live as we want to live. Grace releases us from the bondage of the law that we might serve Christ in newness of the Spirit. In other words, not from the vantage point of that I have to do these things. It's now we are free to do these things of our, of our desire and of our will. We want to do that. So uh, the royal law, keeping the commandments, is all about loving your neighbor as yourself. So I'd say that's the heart of love. The very essence of love is that we keep God's commandments. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Love's antiquity and love's heart. That's say, uh, lastly, the growth of love. The way that love uh, is supposed to advance and keep us going farther. And so the Bible says here, uh, in verse number six, this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, you, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. It goes on to talk about many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So he says in verse eight, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we, which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. In other words, that we need to be advancing and or going forward in the truth of God's love. Philippians 1.9 says this, And this I pray, that, you, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That means this, that as we grow in the Christian life, our love should deepen. Typically what happens is, as we grow in any relationship, we begin to take things for granted. We tend to love less. The Apostle Paul said, uh, the more that I love, the less I be loved. Yet, he said, I'm willing rather to, be, to spend and, and also be spent. He did not do it for the purpose of getting people to love him. He did it for the purpose of getting them to understand God's love. If you really stop to, if you spend time in your Christian life meditating on the love of God, there's no way that you come away from it without a deeper appreciation for God's love and a deeper love for God himself so that you begin to love his word. You begin to love prayer. You begin to love his people. Because, and you begin to, oh, by the way, and then you begin to love a lost and dying world. You see, sometimes we because we are instructed that we ought to do it, we hand out gospel tracts and we begin to witness and things like that. But we are supposed to grow to the place where love motivates us to do that. Where it's not simply because, you know, and there's, there's a, a big thing, different uh, churches in, in, in uh, probably most of the states across the United States have been engaged in things trying to, uh, see how many tracts they can hand out and kind of totaling them together by city, totaling together by state, et cetera, to see you know, how many tracts can be handed out in a certain period of time. I, I'm not against that kind of thing, but, but see, a lot of times we do that, oh, so we're trying to get our numbers up. 
so we're going to give out lots of tracts. I'm not, a, I'm not a, listen, I, whether some do it out of pretense or others, they, you know, what, whatever the word of God is preached, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I'm not trying to be critical of that. <clears throat> but I also, you know, understand, you know, just a while back, uh, the Culver's restaurants were involved in some competition uh, across the country, right? See, see which ones could sell more bacon. What can be bad about that, right? It's like bring on the bacon, right? Heart attack on a bun. I'm just saying, just bring it on. And, uh, and I don't know how true it is or whatever. I don't know if it's done regionally or whatever. But my wife recently asked, we were going through the drive through uh, down at Culver's, which is, you know, something her car her car, it's built in, you know, automated right into the steering of the car. When she gets near Culver's, it, you let go of the wheel and it just turns in and, uh, and it goes right through the drive through So she asked the lady at the window, hey, did that, did that thing get over? She goes, oh, yeah, that, that ended such and such a time. She says, well, my wife's like, well, how did we do? Like, like we're invested in it. But she was, but she was, she was helping, right? She was buying the bacon. I mean, she was like... She's all engaged. They, and she said, oh, we, our store won. Now, I don't know if it was national or state. I don't really don't know. I, I, I never saw the, 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 you know, the official uh, uh, requirements for that or the, the guidelines or whatever. But, oh, we won. And it's like, yes, you know. <laughs> I, I want to know, okay, our store won. Does that mean that we get free bacon for a year as customers? I mean, shouldn't we all enjoy the prosperity of our store winning, right? And uh, so we should get free bacon on any, any sandwich for a year. Um, that's what I, I said when she said, oh, we won. Oh, do we get free bacon? Oh, no. Oh, okay, well, what did we win? Just, I don't know, just a, an award, a trophy or whatever. I, how does that taste? No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure how a trophy tastes. Maybe you put bacon on it. I don't know, but... But, you know, a lot of times we, if we're not careful, we get into, and, and it's okay. Listen, if obedience gets you doing what God wants you to do to start off with, then obey him. Obey him. But what his desire is, is that we begin looking at people and seeing people for whom Jesus died. And because he loves them, we ought to love them enough to share Christ with them. Because he loves our family, we ought to love our family because it's somebody, those are all people for whom Jesus died. If, if we look at the missionary that comes through <clears throat> in uh, different places, from different places around the world, and they show us uh, on the screen the, the uh, thousands upon thousands of people that need the gospel it's easy to say, well, yes, they need the gospel. Here's a plan that we can, we can mobilize to try to get them the gospel and get it done and pat ourselves on the back. Look what we did. But that's different than what God's desire is. He wants us to see them and have compassion on them as did Jesus. When he looked on them, when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion, compassion. And so... So the Bible declares for us, if you have the gift of prophecy, if you have all knowledge, all these things and don't have love or charity, you are nothing. You become as a sounding brass, tinkling cymbal, praise and worship band without any substance. Love is supposed to grow. First Thessalonians, matter of fact, turn uh, to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And we'll be done for this evening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 9 and 10. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. 
but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase, <clears throat> say it out loud with me, class, more and more. What does God want us to do? He wants our love to increase more and more. I could ask you today, men, do you love your wives? And you would say yes. And I would say God wants you to increase your love more and more. I could say, parents, do you love your children? And you would say, absolutely, yes. But he wants your love to increase more and more. Wives, do you love your husbands? Oh, absolutely. But he wants your love to increase more and more. What about your acquaintances and friends, <clears throat> coworkers? Do you, do you care about them? Oh, yes, I do. But he wants that love to increase more and more. In other words, God desires our love to continue to grow towards one another. That's how superior love is. That's how supreme <clears throat> love is. There are very few things that God desires that we just increase more and more and more. But what he does desire is for us to love one another. Loves antiquity, loves heart, <clears throat> and excuse me, and loves growth. The writings of John, the apostle of love, the disciple whom Jesus loved, tells us that we ought to love to love God, we keep his commandments. Father, I pray that you would help us in this brief study of your word tonight, that we might comprehend something about your desire for us in this little epistle of 2 John. Just, just a short passage of scripture and yet so full of meaning concerning your love for us and how we ought to love one another God, I pray that we would understand that this is the commandment, uh, that this is love, that we keep his com uh, your commandments, and this is the commandment, that we love one another and that we should walk in it. It's, it's from ancient times. It is as old, is it old as man that we love one another. God, it is still, is, it is still paramount today that we learn to love one another. God, as we think about your love, aren't we all glad it is never-ending? It, uh, it is the depths of which we cannot fully explore, but we keep trying. We keep trying to dig down to find uh, how, how deep its meaning, how rich and full its blessing, and yet it is inexhaustible because it, it finds its, its definition in a limitless God. And so, God, may we continue to try and let you bring us to the point where you'd have us to be in our love for you and our love for one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name with our heads bowed and right.